Okay, thank you. Thanks for sticking around. Only me standing between you and freedom, so I'll try and make it as painless as possible. Um, for my day job, I do fairly mundane and uninteresting things as a computer officer and web developer at the University of St Andrews. Um, but I'm also the chair of the Save Weems Ancient Cave Society. So the happy coincidence of those two things meant that I became uh, quite heavily involved in the 4D Weems, uh, 4D Weems Caves, um, 4D Weems Caves project. Um, I don't know, do you want me to wait still? I'm just going to see if they're coming up. That, that's how it was advertised. Shall I just carry on? <laughs> Um, okay, I'll, I'll just carry on anyway, because uh, I probably want to get out of here as much as you do. <laughs> um, okay, so this is us, literally. So the Weems Caves are 30 yards, 30 yards, 30 miles that way. Um, so you've still got time to go and see them when this finishes. Um, it'll still be light enough to go and see them. What they are is, um, it's a stretch of coastline... Um, which contains a number of uh, red sandstone caves. It's a strip of land. Okay, well, I'll, I'll carry on anyway, Tom. It, it's, a, it's a strip of, um, narrow strip of land at a coast edge, about 800 metres long. Uh, it contains a number of sandstone caves created by the sea around 10,000 years or, or so ago. Um, so, in geological terms, they're, they're absolutely babies. Um, this is a typical cave. This is the entrance to the um, to, to the Dew Cave, um, and you can see from there how close the Shingle Beach comes up to the to, to the to the cave uh, entrance, and that's something I'll talk about a bit a bit later. In the on the walls of this cave, there are um, a number of interesting um, niches, which are, uh, were certainly in the medieval period used to keep pigeons in. So this was a source of meat and uh, and eggs for the for the for the estate living there, um, there is a view they might actually be much older and more interesting than that, but I'm not going to go into that now. It's a site that has uh, evidence of activity for 5,000 years or so. So there's uh, ard marks um, from from uh, from early farming. There is cup and ring marks. There's midget cup marks. Possible Iron Age figures. We also have a medieval castle dating back to at least the 11th century, not in that stone form, but there's been one there since at least then and, and possibly earlier. Uh, there's a holy well which contains Victorian graffiti beautifully carved in copper plate. It's got a very strong industrial heritage as well um, and that's actually one of the problems with the site. Again, I'll come on to that later, but we've got some fantastic um, imagery. So, for example, the... Um, Bottom left-hand picture is uh, a bunch of miners on their break gambling inside one of the caves, which is what they did. They just went off and and and, and, uh, and gambled. So that's taken some time in the 1930s, and it's got a very early uh, gas works as well, which supplied two of the two of the neighbouring villages. So there's a lot on the site, but that's not what it's famous for. What it's famous for, and what's really important for, is things like this. So most of you will immediately recognise that as a picture symbol. Um, found everywhere um, from Weems, which is on the, the, the coast of the Forth. And incidentally, this is the, the southernmost place you will find picture symbols. Um, nothing on this side of the Forth, everything on, on the other side of the Forth. Um, but they're found all the way up, up, to, up to Shetland. It would have had meaning to the people all the way up to Shetland. Now, of course, there's many carved picture stones in, uh, in Scotland, something over 200. There's a lot of them a couple of hundred yards just over there in the National Museum, which I'd recommend you, you go and look, to, look at a very, very interesting collection of the picture stones. Um, but almost all of those are on monumental stones in the landscape. So they're, 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 they're carved onto stones that have been deliberately positioned in the landscape. At Weems, they're carved into the living rock inside the caves themselves. And this is uh, really the, the first thing that makes them extremely special, because that makes them extremely rare. Um, so to put the context, into context the, caving, the carvings at Weems, there are only eight caves in Scotland which have any sort of Pictish carving in them, and five of those are at Weems. 
There's a total of 60 carvings in those eight caves that are identifiably Pictish, and 49 of those are at Weems. So the vast majority of any evidence we have for modern monumental Pictish carving actually comes from, uh, comes from, this, from this site. Um, and actually, I was just reading last night, the latest issue of Antiquity, there's, it published, I think, only yesterday, there's an article from uh, Gordon Noble and others arguing um, that as a result of recent excavations elsewhere, they want to push back earlier the date of the origin of a lot of Pictish carving by a couple of hundred years, and they cite Weems as one of the places where they think that, that carving actually originated, possibly as early as the 3rd, 4th century um, AD. So for a number of reasons, it's... Um, it, 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 it's an important site. Just run through some of the other carvings. Um, sorry, that's a Pictish. That's a Pictish boat, um, one of only two um, that, that are known. It's got a collection of um, early Christian crosses, probably made by missionaries from Iona in the seventh century or so. So you wrap all that together, and it's a very, very important site. Um, but the tragedy is, it's also in a terrible state because of where it is and because of the evidence, of, uh, because of the effects of human activity. So I said earlier that Weems has 49 of the Pictish cave carvings. That's not actually quite true. It had 49, now it only has 26. And it only has 26 as a result of all sorts of degradations that it suffered um, in, in, the, in the past. So coastal erosion is an obvious one. That, that's ongoing. It's nothing new. The uh, picture in the top left-hand corner is from the, uh, the uh, I think that was from the 1960s. That ducot, the, the pigeon loft that you can see next to it, forms part of the schedule, scheduling um, um, instructions for the, for the area. That's long gone. That doesn't exist anymore. Um, next to it is a stretch of coastline that was taken, I think that was from the 1950s, um, complete destruction of, that, uh, of a large section of coast. And we have this periodically every year, we get major, major events that take away even more of the coast. Um, coal mining has caused a lot, I, mentioned, I talked about the miners earlier, that's caused a huge amount of problems. Structural instability inside the caves, changes to the water table has actually meant it, uh, has caused a lot, lot of potential problems potential problems because uh, the shafts run directly underneath the caves and out, uh, out into the out into the fourth um, and um, although actually in, in some, although the coal mining had it caused a lot of problems in some ways it actually served to help protect the caves at one point because they were just dumping the coal waste on the on the beaches and uh, for a number of years that actually for a long period that protected it from the from the coastal erosion so although there would be no thought of actually doing that now in some ways that their, 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 their disregard for the local history with the coal mining actually to, to some extent probably helped to help protect the coastline for a while but with all that gone that's just now all been eroded away and we're back to, to eating into the in, in, in eating into the coastline so um, top right hand corner is a picture of a car that was set on fire in one of the caves in 1986 and resulted in the destruction of the panel of carvings at the bottom. So they're gone. Um, the West Du Cave, which contained a high num large number of superb carvings, probably the best cave of the whole lot, that vanished in 1914 when a coastal defence battery was put on top of it in the First World War and fired for the first time, brought down the whole, the whole cave. Um, and to say human activity, the continuous use of the caves has taken its toll. They've been used for all sorts of light manufacturing. The, the villagers used to, to store their boats and their nets in there. Um, and there's all sorts of evidence of, of them being used for different types of storage. Now, uh, human activity also often comes in the form of vandalism, arson, etc. It's an annual, uh, annual event uh, where, where we have some problem on the site. So, what to do about it? Well, on a practical level, we've developed... Um, a conservation management plan with HES, the Scape Trust, uh, Five Council, the Five Coastal Countryside Trust, and the landowners Weems, Weems Estate all work together in a um, the Weems Claims Action Group to take steps to protect the heritage. And there's lots of good things going on with that, but that's not what I'm going to talk about today. We hope to have some very good news soon uh, about some new developments there. Uh, we do a lot of public engagement with tours. We uh, this year had a Living History Festival that attracted 300 or so local people to it. Um, so we do a lot on the ground to preserve the case, but nevertheless, it's because it's an extremely important but extremely vulnerable site, one of the priorities was to actually, firstly, let's just record what's there. Let's set a baseline for what we've got, um, as well as trying to stop any further, further degradation site. Let's, let's do a, a high quality, 
high resolution survey of the whole thing and in, in, in great detail and um, uh, and against then against that baseline we can then annually monitor what, the condition and what's going on but more than that we wanted to use that same data set to tell the story of the of the site uh, and provide a way for people to fully explore the caves and their their contents um, in, in a way that's never been done before. So there was already uh, a wide range of content from the historic study of the Weems Caves, but until now it's never been brought together and it's never been presented in any sort of coherent collection. So what we wanted to do with the main output of the of project, which was the Weems Caves 4D website, was to um, bring together all the reliable information about the caves together with a new high quality da digital data set um, to let people see as much information as they possibly could about the caves from within a realistic cave uh, environment which we generated from the 3D, uh, 3D modelling that we did. So the project started in 2013. It was a mix of professional archaeologists led by the, the Scape Trust um, together with our very enthusiastic but amateur uh, local members of SWACS, say Weems Ancient Cave Society, and the local wider community. Um, now, we're not the first people to uh, document the caves, and we're certainly not the first to do so with the best technology of the age. This isn't actually an old photograph. This is our recreation of what they were doing uh, at the turn, of the, 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 the turn of the 20th century. This is a picture of um, a, a guy playing the role of John Patrick, who was a local man, and his daughter Jessie, who were photographing the caves in 1902 with a box camera and magnesium flare. And despite the appearances of one of our volunteers going up in flames, uh, no one was actually harmed in the making of that. Um, but since uh, the antiquarian James Young Simpson uh, visited in 1865 and made the first records of what's in the caves, just about every cutting-edge documentation technique that um, of the time has been applied to the, to, to the carvings. So that includes uh, rubbings by uh, people like the, the pioneering uh, Christian, uh, Christian McLagan, beautiful drawings, early photography, um, taking of casting plaster, latex, fibreglass, basically everything has been thrown at the caves o o over the years. And laser scanning made its debut back in 2005. So we used everything we could this time around as well. Um, what you have here is the laser scanning. Um, Marcus Abbott, then working for, for YAT, did the, did the laser scanning and um, across the, the 800 metres of coastline you can see the, 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 the condensed laser scanning results. At, at the bottom there, that's the, that's the compressed version of uh, about half a terabyte of scanning data that we collected from, from along the, the whole coast. And there was an immediate benefit from that because in the top right hand corner you can see the, what remains of the castle and underneath it one of the caves. Now it had been thought and there were serious proposals to fill in that cave because it was thought to be causing structural instability to the castle. And so by that laser survey we immediately managed to demonstrate that wasn't the case and that no remedial action, i.e. filling it with slurry and concrete um, and, and then a stroke destroying the Victorian carvings in that cave, uh, we, we managed to, to, to avoid that, that, that happening. Um, we also did a photogrammetry um, survey, 24,000 photographs were taken of the site uh, using a drone to capture the landscape and for the individual carvings we recorded every single thing using uh, reflectance transformation imaging. And I just want to say a little bit about that because it's come up a few, a, a few times and it's a technique I think that people aren't necessarily familiar with so apologies for those of you that are. Um, but Basically, the main practitioners and really the only source of software for it are these people, cultural heritage imaging. Um, they'll also sell you a toolkit with all the, the, the basic kit you need to do, although it is possible to put it together yourselves. Um, and although their software can be a bit clunky, once you know where they're clunk, what the clunks are and how to work around them, actually it gets the job done very, very well and you can get very, very good results. And in our case, we got very good results with, with, with a completely amateur um, group of volunteers who, who, who did all this, all this recording. Um, I was going to go on at length about how RTI works, I don't think I'm going to have time to do that, but all the explanations are on the website. Effectively you're creating a model of the way in which a surface reflects or absorbs, uh, or absorbs light, essentially, and it allows you to then virtually move your light source around and look at it from directions that you never actually look, you, you never looked at it from when you were taking the, taking the original photography. Um, so, so I'm going to have to skip through that, but we got 60 
very high resolution RTI models or, or, or created by, by, by volunteers. You have to have a robust workflow because it's not, it, it's not necessarily a straightforward thing to do, particularly in a cave environment where you've got, they're not really made for, uh, for they're not laboratory conditions, put it that way. Um, and it, it can be quite difficult and you can guarantee that however good your workflow is, somebody will kick the tripod three quarters of the way through <laughs> and make sure you have to start all over again. Um, this is one of the models, the 3D models uh, from the laser scanning, uh, textured using high resolution photography. This is a cutaway of the, of the cork cave. Um, and what we did with each of the caves is went into them, into, inside the models and generated um, equirectangular panoramic views from within them. Um, so there's 30 of them all together. These are the ones that we generated from within cork caves. So these aren't panoramas taken by photography within the caves. These are generated from the models within the caves and we use that as the basis for, for the website um, and that was that's done in uh, Pano 2 VR I don't know if people are familiar with that but that gives you that can give you quite a good um, HTML5 output that you can then play with we had to process that further because we wanted to put all sorts of overlays about information and, and the RTI scans popping up from within it um, so we had to do quite a bit of work and there was quite a bit of hair head scratching and hair pulling but got there in the end um, and actually what we ended up with was that the RTI scans are one type of data content we've got videos we've got images we've got galleries um, we've got text overlays and we ended up really creating just the, the website really just a framework for all those different types of content and they've all really got their own API methods so they can all talk to each other and pull each other up from within their own context as well so that was quite a, quite a nice thing to do it means there's nothing hardwired in the eventual website and that we can just slot in new content types and add to our, 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 layer, our layers of content which are all held in a relations database um, if we decide to, to do new methods so the site itself um, that's the photogrammetry model that's the way in you can go directly into any of the caves um, but we call it a 4d website because you can go back in time this is looking at it as it is now that's going back to uh, Victoria to, to, to 1900 have we gone back to them yes we've gone back to the medieval period when the castles at its biggest extent and there's a bit more land and finally that's the Pictish landscape. Lots more land. We know there was farming out there, and we put little little farms in, um, and so on. So within each cave, we have this is this is a still of one of the panoramas. You've got we've got the positions of all the carvings on the wall, so you can just click on one of those, bring up the RTI, and 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 and, and look at it. Um, so I mentioned one of the one of the biggest jobs we had to do was get the RTI web viewer working. Um, there is an RTI web viewer and it's written by um, Giampaolo Palmer of the Visual Computing Lab um, in Italy um, and we chose that basically because it's the only thing there was um, to get working um, but because it's all open source and everything is, is, is relatively easy to, 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 to understand uh, we managed to sort of reverse engineer it and get it to work in the way in which we wanted. One of the things we needed to do was to be able to show the RTI image next to the, to the historic images showing what it looked like in 1890 because we wanted to give a sense of how things had changed over time. Anyway, we got it done eventually, um, which was great. And this is what we ended up with. So this is uh, the pop-up RTI viewer of a, well, it might be a horse, it might be a bull, it might be a lion written by, uh, drawn by someone that's never seen a lion. All theories about what it, what it is. Um, we have various different photographs to go back to to show what it used to look like. But this is showing, showing it RTI just from a sort of, sort of straight on view. If we move the light to the bottom left, you can see it enhances the legs. We can see much more detail there than we, than we possibly could before on the legs. Um, moving it into the top right corner brings out the head. Not, not quite so clearly as the legs, but there's certainly far more detail there that you can just see with a single photograph of the, of the carving. Um, and the little icons at the bottom there show the various historic photos that can be called up alongside it. So that's what it looked like to the people who drew it in 18... Uh, what date is that? 18, 1890. Right, as well as this is one of the other panoramas inside the cork cave, and as well as showing what they look like now, we wanted to show what they looked like then. So having access to those digital models gave us a great resource to be able to play with them, and basically, in the case of the cork cave, take away that brick supporting pillar, get rid of the rubble that's collapsed at the cave mouth, and put it back to how it would have looked 1,500 years ago, or thereabouts. 
And so this, one of the things we learned from this immediately, and again, this, we, we look, had a lot of insights we gained from, from, from this project. One of the things we learned immediately was that all the Pictish carvings are on walls that would have been brightly lit at some point during the day. And that was a real insight because we'd never realised that before. This isn't Paleolithic carving where you're crawling into a narrow space to, go, go, to do something uh, in the dark. This is things that were meant to be seen. And again, it f tells us a little bit more about Pictish symbols and, and not necessarily specifically what they meant, but the way in which they were meant to be viewed and, and, and who was meant to have access to them. Um, we also completely rebuilt a cave. This is the collapsed West Duke cave, the one that had the gun fired on top of it. And fortunately, we had uh, an 1890 survey by John Romilly Allen, who gave, who um, recorded it, it, surveyed it in such detail, including the positions of the carvings, that we would be able to take our 3D landscape model and basically fill in the void where the cave should have been from his sketches, and in doing so, completely recreate that cave, that cave that hasn't been seen for a hundred years or so until we yeah, virtually dug it out of the ground again. Um, there's loads more in the site. I haven't possibly got time to go through them. Um, we have reconstructed the gas works. We've reconstructed the, gar the castle. And there's animations of those going on. And I'll talk about that as a bit of an aside. But they, that were, they were actually quite major projects in themselves to go through all the, 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 the survey information, on the, the, the ground surveys, the antiquarian sketches, the photographs, the talking with the experts who knew about these things. Uh, they were actually quite major things in, in their own right to, to produce those animations. Um, we've got over 60 historic images of people that have been there before and what they've done with it. And we've also got a complete excavation record. So every, any mention of the Weems Caves in, in archaeological documents or any excavations that have been done, you can get it all from the catalogue on the, on the site. But we also wanted to make everything available. So this is our old friend, the horse, lion, bull thing. Um, this is shown using the RTI viewer that you can get on your desktop. The, the web version only allows a sort of very basic uh, operation. With the desktop version, because you're talking, every, every pixel basically is a mathematical function describing how light will behave when shone from a particular direction on that point. You can then stick all sorts of other functions on top of it as well to increase specularity, enhance the peaks and troughs and so on. This is just showing the sort of evaluated normals from, from the surface. But again, it shows you far better than the straightforward photograph of what it would be like. But you can download all these. Anybody can go and get every single one of these that we created, high resolution original PTM files. Um, we because all the models are geo-referenced um, with GPS points on the ground, it means they're all in real-world coordinates and we can do really useful things for them for conservation purposes. So um, this is from the drone survey of 2015 um, and it's a short stretch of coast, coastline. You'll probably have to take my word for it and watch this very closely, but we flew this again in 2018 with a completely different drone and completely different pilot. And such is the accuracy of of photogrammetry, even at that scale, that we can completely overlay the model resulting from the 2015 uh, 18 survey on the 2015 one. So, and so this is a, 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 an ortho photo, top down, looking at the coast edge. And so this is 2015. Keep your eye on in the middle here, and you're probably just about to see some huge bits of seawall move a bit inland, and a bit more of the coast be taken out. As I say, you, I, you, I, can't really spend time proving that to you, but that, we can basically measure a millimetre accuracy from the photogrammetry model what the extent of coast erosion is. It's not a substitute for actually being there on the ground and doing it as well, but it means that it gives us, it gives us a, a, an easy way of scanning along and having a very, very quick look as has anything changed. Right, what else are we doing with it? This is a, the development, a shot of it under development of the virtual reality version. That works already on the Oculus Rift. We're creating a version for Oculus Go, which will go in, um, which means we can take it out to schools, um, but we can also put it inside our visitor center because we get, it's a difficult landscape to navigate. So one of the things we want to do is actually have an experience for people that can't physically visit a lot of the caves. And having a, a couple of Oculus Goes in the visitor center will uh, uh, allow, us to, allow us to do that. We will hopefully follow that with uh, a web VR version. So you can actually have a, the, VR, the full VR experience from anywhere. Um, augmented reality, basically all the good ideas that I've been hearing about today, we're going to have a crack at them, I'm sure. <laughs> um, but a lot of them we've already thought of, so augmented reality certainly for people visiting the caves um, as, as part of the interpretation, sticking the whole thing into 3D game engine to allow full first person exploration rather than just limiting people to the panoramic views, um, and the yeah, 3D printing merchandising. 
go away with the panels, the carvings, etc., etc. All that stuff we can generate all of that out of the same the same data set that we've got. So, in conclusion, um, as you can see, we're very pleased with it. This is some of the volunteers at the opening of the the, uh, the launch of the website, um, and just just the conclusions very quickly. Um, what it's allowed us to do, the, the, by, by using the latest technologies, it's allowed us to sort of address a whole range of issues from conservation to interpretation um, um, and, and everything else that I've talked about. Um, and it's allowed us to reconstruct them and gain insights in a way that we couldn't possibly have done um, with, without using this sort of technology. In a worst case scenario, you know, cave collapse, uh, coastal slope failure or whatever, um, or destructive vandalism, we can actually now literally rebuild what, what was there. Obviously, we hope that never gets to it, but it does give us that, that, that possibility of, of having that, that level of quality recording. Um, and as a management resource, this is what we use for our annual survey where we go along the coast and, and the caves and look at every single asset that we have and, and what condition it's in. So, um, I've been told I have to put this slide in. Um, <laughs> Because this was us getting our award for being on the shortlist of the for the best public presentation of archaeology at the British Archaeological Awards this year, um, which we're very proud of. Um, but it's also got us a, very, a lot of good publicity. Because something else that's come out of this project is the fact that we're doing this work. It's interesting to the media. It's interesting to, to, to local people that we're actually throwing this sort of um, a technology and this sort of level of interest at something that's largely long been regarded as a fairly desperate, forgotten a site you can do nothing with. Um, and so that increased publicity and that increased awareness is something that is really also part of, of creating a future for the caves. Um, and they put, put it this way, we now have a lot more people on Facebook telling us something must be done. And the more people that say something must be done, uh, the more chance there is of actually getting, getting something done. So all in all, I think there's so many positives about the project and, and, and so much we've learned from it. Um, I actually had a relatively low budget. Um, it should be said as well. This isn't uh, th th this isn't something that's cost the earth to do. Um, I just think it, 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 it's something we've learned a lot from. And if everybody anybody wants to talk to me afterwards to, to, to some of the pitfalls and some of the some of the things we've learned from it, I'm happy to do so. Um, but I'll shut up now. <laughs> <laughs>